front of me. Just going to post the link on to Instagram as well. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. Create link to YouTube live. Now I have to be I think that I have to, um... oh, that's not right, learn more, no, I don't want to learn more, I hate learning more, no learning, feedback, there's a way for me to share this manning, no, not manager, aha, I just need to type out the URL, this feels silly, I'm sure there is a way that I can figure out to do it on my phone and actually do this right, but hopefully this works. When I have finished doing this, then we will recap yesterday's session and we'll start. 8VR. In the meantime, enjoy some personal. Or Purcell, if you prefer. So yesterday, Bertie goes and beards good old Pop Bassett in his den, as it were, with the threat of marrying his niece, Stephanie Bing, otherwise known as Stiffy. Upon hearing this, uh, Sir Watkin Bassett is perturbed in his soul and uh, goes on to be delighted when, he, when Stephanie comes and tells him that, no, indeed, Bertie is not the man, but that she loves Harold Pinker, the curate. And he's okay with that after a bit of brisk threatening with Bertie, because he really, really doesn't like Bertie at all. And then, let's see, Bertie goes off, and Madeline Bassett wants to see him and decides that she will make him happy. So he explains the whole thing. Is that this one? This one. Might have been two nights ago. Anyways, she's... She's feeling... Oh, no, no, that's right. It was off because... The wedding was off because Sir Watkin Bassett had read the book. Righto. Okay, uh, I'd read the book. So there was the cow creamer incident last time. So, forget all the rest of that. Uh, Madeline and Gussie are reconciled to one another, I think, but Pop Bassett is angry at Gussie because he has been reading the notebook that Gussie foolishly gave him to make a final point because he was ticked off that he had, had, had disposed of his newts. So, at this moment, they have managed to send the cow creamer off with one of Bertie's suitcases and Gussie out through the window, down the knotted sheet, um, dropping the suitcase on Gussie's head, cow creamer inside, and sent him off to London in Bertie's car. So we'll see if that works. Gussie seems to have figured out how to foul up most things. But we'll see how that turns out. And 
Eves has just discovered a policeman's helmet in the other suitcase. Chapter 13. I had been right about the strengthening effect on the character of the vicissitudes to which I had been subjected since clocking in at the country residence of Sir Watkin Bassett. Little by little, bit by bit, they had been moulding me, turning me from a sensitive clubman and boulevardier to a man of chilled steel. A novice to conditions in this pest house abruptly handed the news item which I had just been handed, would, I imagine, have rolled up the eyeballs and swooned where he, where he sat. But I... I toughened and fortified by the routine of one damn thing after another, which constituted life at Totley Towers, was enabled to keep my head and face the issue. I don't say I didn't leave my chair like a jackrabbit that has sat on a cactus, but having risen, I wasted no time in fruitless twittering. I went to the door and locked it. Then, tight-lipped and pale, I came back to Jeeves, who had now taken the helmet from the suitcase and was oscillating it meditatively by its strap. His first word showed me that he had got the wrong angle on the situation. It would have been wiser, sir, he said with faint reproach, to have selected some more adequate hiding place. I shook my head. I may even have smiled wanly, of course. My swift intelligence had enabled me to probe to the bottom of this thing. Not me, Jeeves. Stiffy. Sir? The hand that placed that helmet there was not mine, but that of S. Bing. She had it in her room. She feared that a search might be instituted, and when I last saw her, I was trying to think of a safer spot. This is her idea of one. I sighed. How do you imagine a girl gets a mind like Stiffy's, Jeeves? And certainly the young lady is somewhat eccentric in her actions, sir. Eccentric? She would step straight into Coney Hatch, and no questions asked. They would lay down the red carpet for her. The more the thoughts dwell on that young shrimp, the more the soul sickens in horror. One peers into the future and shudders at one's, what one sees there. One has to face it, Jeeves. Stiffy, who is pure padded cell from the foundations up, is about to marry the Reverend H.P. Pinker, himself about as pronounced a goop as ever broke bread. And there is no reason to suppose, one has to face this too, that the union will not be blessed. There will, that is to say, ere long be little feet pattering about the home. And what one asks oneself is, just how safe will human life be in the vicinity of those feet, assuming, as one is forced to assume, that they will inherit the combined loopiness of two such parents? It is with a sort of tender pity, Jeeves, that I think of the nurses, the governesses, the private schoolmasters and the public schoolmasters who will likely take on the responsibility of, that, of looking after a blend of Stephanie Bing and Harold Pinker, little knowing they are coming up against something hotter than mustard. However, I went on, abandoning these speculations, all this, though of absorbing interest, is not really germane to the issue. Contemplating that helmet and bearing in mind that the fact that the Oates Bassett comedy duo will be arriving at any moment to start their search, what would you recommend? It is a little difficult to say, huh? A really effective hiding place for so bulky an object does not readily present itself. No, the damn thing seems to fill the room, doesn't it? It unquestionably takes the eye, sir. Huh? Yes. The authorities wrought well when they shaped this helmet for Constable Oates. They aimed to finish him off impressively, not to give him something which would balance on top of his head like a peanut. And they succeeded. You couldn't hide a lid like this in an impenetrable jungle. Ah, oh, well, I said... We will just have to see what tact and suavity will do. I wonder when these birds are going to arrive. I suppose we may expect them very shortly. Ah, that would be the hand of doom now, if I mistake not, Jeeves. But in assuming that a knocker who had just knocked on the door was Sir Watkin Bassett, I had erred. It was Stiffy's voice that spoke. Bertie, let me in. There was nobody I was more anxious to see, but I did not immediately fling wide the gates. Prudence dictated a preliminary inquiry. Have you got that bally dog of yours with you? No, he's being aired by the butler. In that case, you may enter. When she did so, it was to find Bertram confronting her with folded arms and a hard look. She appeared, however, not to notice my forbidding exterior. Bertie, darling. She broke off, checked by a fairly animal snarl from the Wooster lips. Not so much of the Bertie, darling. I have just one thing to say to you, young Stiffy, and it is this. Was it you who put that helmet in my suitcase? Of course it was. That's what I was coming to talk to you about. You remember I was trying to think of a good place. 
I racked the brain quite a bit, and then suddenly I got it. And now I've got it. The acidity of my tone seemed to surprise her. She regarded me with girlish wonder, the wide-eyed kind. But you don't mind, do you, Bertie, darling? Ha! But why? I thought you would be so glad to help me out. Oh, yes, I said, and I meant it to sting. I couldn't risk having Uncle Watkin find it in my room. You prefer, prefer to have him find it in mine? But how can he? He can't come searching your room. He can't, eh? Of course not. You're his guest. And you suppose that will cause him to hold his hand? I smiled one of those bitter, sardonic smiles. I think you are attributing to the old poison germ a niceness of feeling and a respect for the laws of hospitality which nothing in his record suggests that he possesses. You can take it from me that he definitely is going to search the room, and I imagine that the only reason he hasn't arrived already is that he is still scouring the house for Gussie. Gussie? He is at the moment chasing Gussie with a hunting crop, but a man cannot go on doing that indefinitely. Sooner or later he will give it up, and then we shall have him here, complete with magnifying glass and bloodhounds. The gravity of the situation had, la had last impressed itself upon her. She uttered a squeak of dismay, and her eyes became a bit soup platey. Oh, Bertie, then I'm afraid I've put you in rather a spot. That covers the facts like a dust sheet. I'm sorry now I ever asked Harold to pinch the thing. It was a mistake, I admit it. Still, after all, even if Uncle Watkin does come here and find it, doesn't matter much, does it? Did you hear that, Jeeves? Yes, sir. Uh... So did I. I see. It doesn't matter, you feel? Well, what I mean is your reputation won't really suffer much, will it? Everybody knows that you can't keep your hands off policemen's helmets. This will be just another one. Ha! And what leads you to suppose, young Stiffy, that when the Assyrian comes down like a wolf on the fold, I shall meekly assume the guilt and not blazon the truth? What, Jeeves? Forth to the world, sir. Thank you, Jeeves. What makes you suppose that I shall merely assume the guilt and not blazon the truth forth to the world? I wouldn't have supposed that her eyes could have widened any more, but they did perceptibly. Another dismayed squeak escaped her. Indeed, such was its volume that it might perhaps be better to call it a squeal. But Bertie! Well? Bertie, listen. I'm listening. Surely you would take the rap. You can't let Harold get it in the neck. You were telling me this afternoon that he would be unfrocked. I won't have him unfrocked. Where is he going to get if they unfrock him? That sort of thing gives a curate a frightful black eye. Why can't you say you did? All it would mean is that you would be kicked out of the house, and I don't suppose you're so anxious to stay on, are you? Possibly you are not aware that your bally uncle is proposing to send the per perpetrator of this outrage to Chokey. Oh no, at the worst, just a fine. Nothing of the kind. He specifically told me Chokey. He didn't mean it. I expect there was... No, there was not a twinkle in his eye. Then that settles it. I can't have my precious angel Harold doing a stretch... How about your precious angel, Bertram? But Harold, sensitive. So am I, sensitive. Not half so sensitive as Harold. Bertie, surely you aren't going to be difficult about this. You're much too good a sport. Didn't you tell me once that the code of the Woosters was never let a pal down? She had found the talking point. People who appeal to the code of the Woosters rarely fail to touch a chord in Bertram. My iron front began to crumble. That's all very fine. Bertie, darling. Yes, I know, but dash it all. Bertie. Oh, well. You will take the rap? I suppose so. She yodeled ecstatically, and I think that if I had not sidestepped, she would have flung her arms about my neck. Certainly she came leaping forward with some such purpose apparently in view. Foiled by my agility, she began to tear off a few steps of that spring dance to which she was so addicted. Thank you, Bertie, darling. I knew you would be sweet about it. I can't tell you how grateful I am and how much I admire you. You remind me of Carter Patterson. No, that's all, not it. Nick Carter. No, not Nick Carter. Who does Mr. Wooster remind me of, Jeeves? Sidney Carton, miss. That's right, Sidney Carton. But he was small-time stuff compared with you, Bertie. And anyway, I expect we're getting the wind up quite unnecessarily. Why, we take it for granted that Uncle Watkin will find the helmet if, she, if he comes and searches the room. There are a hundred places where you can hide it. And before I could say, name three... She had pirouetted to the door and pirouetted out. I could hear her dying away in the distance with a song on the lips. My own, as I turned to Jeeves, were twisted in a bitter smile. Women, Jeeves? Yes, sir. Uh... Well, Jeeves, I said, my hand stealing towards the decanter, this is the end. No, sir. 
I started with a violence that nearly unshipped my front uppers. Not the end. No, sir. You don't mean you have an idea? Yes, sir. But you just told me now that, that you hadn't. Yes, sir. But since then I've been giving the matter some thought, and am now in a position to say Eureka. I say what? Eureka, sir, like Archimedes. Did he say Eureka? I thought that was Shakespeare. No, sir. Archimedes. What I would recommend is that you drop the helmet out of the window. It is most improbable that it will occur to Sir Watkin to search the exterior of the premises, and we shall be able to recover it at our leisure. He paused and stood listening. Should this suggestion meet with your approval, sir, I feel that a certain haste would be advisable. I fancy I can hear the sound of approaching footsteps. On the second floor passage of Totley Towers, the enemy were upon us. With the nippiness of a lamb in the fold on observing the Assyrian's approach, I snatched up the helmet, bounded to the window, and tossed the thing into the night. And scarcely had I done so when the door opened, and through it came, in the order named, Aunt Dahlia, wearing an amused and indulgent look, as if she were joining in some game to please the children, Pop Bassett, in a purple dressing gown, and Police Constable Oates, who was dabbing at his nose with a pocket handkerchief. So sorry to disturb you, Bertie, said the aged relative courteously. Not at all, I replied with equal suavity. Is there something I can do for the multitude? Sir Watkin has got some extraordinary idea into his head about wanting to search your room. Search my room? He glanced at Aunt Dahlia, raising the eyebrows. I don't understand. What's all this about? She laughed indulgently. You will hardly believe it, Bertie, but he thinks that cow cream of his is, is here. Is it missing? It's been stolen. You don't say. Yes. Well, well, well. He's very upset about it. I don't wonder. Most distressed. Poor old bloke. I placed a kindly hand on Pop's, Pop Bassett's shoulder. Probably the wrong thing to do, I can see, looking back. For it did not soothe. I can do without your condolences, Mr. Wooster, and I should be glad if you would not refer to me as a bloke. I have every reason to believe that not only is my cow creamer in your possession, but Constable Oates's helmet as well. A cheery guffaw seemed in order. I uttered it. Ha ha! Aunt Dahlia came across with another. Ha ha! How dashed absurd! Perfectly ridiculous. What on earth would I be doing with cow creamers? Or policemen's helmets? Quite. Did you ever hear such a weird idea? Never. My dear old host, I said, let us keep perfectly calm and cool and get all this straightened out. In the kindliest spirit, I must point out that you are on the verge, if not slightly past the verge, of making an ass of yourself. That sort of thing won't do, you know. You can't dash about accusing people of nameless crimes without a shadow of evidence. I have all the evidence I require, Mr. Wooster. That's what you think. And that, I maintain, is where you are making the floater of a lifetime. When was this modern Dutch gadget of yours abstracted? He quivered beneath the thrust, pin pinkening at the tip of his nose. It is not modern Dutch. Well, we can thresh that out later. The point is, when did it leave the premises? It has not left the premises. Now, that again is what you think. Well, when was it stolen? About twenty minutes ago. Now, then there you are. Twenty minutes ago I was up here in my room. This rattled him. I had thought it would. Here in my room. This rattled him. I had thought it would. You were in your room? In my room. Alone? On the contrary, Jeeves was there. Who is Jeeves? Oh, don't you know Jeeves? This is Jeeves. Jeeves, Sir Watkin Bassett. And who may you be, my man? That Pop Bassett's face was disfigured. If you could disfigure a face like his by an ugly sneer. I regret, Mr. Wooster, that I am not prepared to accept as conclusive evidence of your innocence the unsupported word of your manservant. Unsupported, eh? Jeeves, go and page Mr. Spode. Tell him I want to, him to come and put a bit of stuffing into my alibi. Very good, sir. He shimmered away, and Pop Bassett seemed to swallow something hard and jagged. Was Roderick Spode with you? Certainly he was. Perhaps you will believe him. Yes, I would believe Roderick Spode. Very well, then. He'll be here in a moment. He appeared to muse. I see. Well, apparently I was wrong, then, in supposing that you are concealing my cow creamer. It must have been purloined by somebody else. Outside job, if you ask me, said Aunt Dahlia. Perhaps the work of an international gang, I hazarded. Very likely. I expect it was all over the place that Sir Watkin had bought the thing, 
You remember Uncle Tom had been counting on getting it, and no doubt he told all sorts of people where it had gone. It wouldn't take long for news to filter through to the international gangs. They keep their ear to the ground. Damn clever, those gangs, assented the aged relative. Pop Bassett had seemed to me to wince a trifle at the mention of Uncle Tom's name. Guilty conscience doing its stuff, no doubt. Gnawing as these guilty consciences do. These guilty consciences do. Well, we need not discuss the matter further, he said. As regards the cow creamer, I admit that you have established your case. We will now... We will now turn to Constable Oates's helmet. That, Mr. Woosler, I happen to know positively is in your possession. Oh, yes? Yes. The constable received specific information on the point from an eyewitness. I will therefore proceed to search your room without delay. You really feel you want to? I do. I shrugged the shoulders. Very well, I said. Very well. If that is the spirit in which you interpret the duties of a host, carry on. We invite inspection. I can only say that you appear to have an extraordinarily rummy view on making your guests comfortable over the weekend. Don't count on my coming here again. I had expressed the opinion to Jeeve that it would be entertaining to stand by and watch this blighter and his colleague ferret about, and so it proved. I don't know when I've extracted more solid amusement from anything, but all these good things have, have to come to an end at last. About ten minutes later, it was plain that the bloodhounds were planning to call it off and pack up. To say that Pop Bassett was wry, as he desisted from his efforts and turned to me, would be to understate it. I appear to owe you an apology, Mr. Wooster. He said, Sir W. Bassett, I rejoined, you never spoke a truer word. And folding my arms and drawing myself to my full height, I let him have it. The exact words of my harangue have, I am sorry to say, escaped my memory. It is a pity that there was nobody taking them down in shorthand, for I am not exaggerating when I say that I surpassed myself. Once or twice, when, it, when a bit lit at routs and revels, I have spoken with an eloquence which, rightly or wrongly, has won the plaudits of the Drones Club, but I don't think that I have ever quite reached the level to which I now soared. You could see the stuffing trickling out of old Bassett in great heaping handfuls. But as I rounded into my peroration, I suddenly noticed that I was failing to grip. He had ceased to listen and was staring past me at something out of my range of vision. And so worth looking at did this spectacle, judging from his expression, appear to be that I turned in order to take a deco. It was the butler who had so riveted Sir Watkin Bassett's attention. He was standing in the doorway, holding in his right hand a silver salver, and on that salver was a policeman's helmet. Chapter 14 I remember old Stinker Pinker, who towards the end of his career at Oxford used to go in for social service in London's tougher districts, describing to me once, in some detail, the sensations he had experienced one afternoon while spreading the light in Bethnal Green on being unexpectedly kicked in the stomach by a costermonger. It gave him, he told me, a strange, dreamy feeling, together with an odd illusion of having walked into a thick fog. And the reason I mention it is that my own emotions at this moment were extraordinarily similar. When I had last seen this butler, if you recollect, on the occasion when he had come to tell me that Madeline Bassett would be glad if I could spare her a moment, I mentioned that he had flickered. It was not so much at a flickering butler that I was gazing now, as at a sort of heaving mist, with a vague suggestion of something butlerine vibrating inside it. Then the scales fell from my eyes, and I was enabled to note the reactions of the rest of the company. They were all taking it extremely big. Pop Bassett, like the chap in the poem which I had had to write out fifty times at school for introducing a white mouse into the English literature hour, was plainly feeling like some watcher of the skies, when a new planet swims into his ken, while Aunt Darley and Constable Oates resembled respectively stout Cortez staring at the Pacific and all his men looking at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. It was a goodish while before anybody stirred. Then, with a choking cry like that of a mother spotting her long-lost child in the offing, Constable Oates swooped forward and grabbed the lid, clasping it to his bosom with visible ecstasy. The movement seemed to break the spell. Old Bassett came to life as if someone had pressed a button. Where, where did you get that, Butterfield? I found it in a flower bed, Sir Watkin. In a flower bed? House. 
I observed Mr. Wooster drop something from his window. It fell into the flower bed beneath, and upon inspection proved to be this helmet. Old Bassett drew in a deep breath. Thank you, Butterfield. The butler breezed off, and old B, revolving on his axis, faced me with gleaming pince-nay. So, he said, there is never very much you can do in the way of a telling comeback when a fellow says, so, to you. I preserved a judicious silence. It's a mistake, said Aunt Dahlia, taking the floor with an intrepidity which became her well. Probably came from one of the other windows. Easy to make a mistake on a dark night. Ah. Or it may be that the man was lying. Yes, that seems a plausible explanation. I think I see it all. This butfield of yours is a guilty man. He stole the helmet, and knowing that the hunt was up and detecting him in it, decided to play a bold game and try to shove it off on Bertie. Eh, hey, Bertie? I shouldn't wonder, Aunt Dahlia. I shouldn't wonder at all. Yes, that is what must have happened. It becomes clear every moment. You can't trust these saintly-looking butlers an inch. Not an inch. I remember thinking the fellow had a furtive eye. Me too. You noticed it yourself, did you? Right away. He reminds me of Murgatroyd. Do you remember Murgatroyd at Brinkley, Bertie? The fellow before Pomeroy, Stoutish Cove. That's right. With a face like a more than usually respectable archbishop. Took us all in that face. We trusted him implicitly. And what was the result? Fellow pinched a finch slice. Fellow pinched a fish slice. Put it up the snout, up the spout, and squandered the proceeds at the dog races. This Butterfield is another Murgatroyd. Some relation, perhaps. I shouldn't be surprised. Well, now that that's all satisfactorily settled, settled and Bertie dismissed without a stain on his character, how about all going to bed? It's getting late, and if I don't have my eight hours, I'm a rag. She'd injected into the proceedings such a pleasant atmosphere of all pals together, and hearty, let's say no more about it, that it came as a shock to find that old Bassett was failing to see eye to eye. He proceeded immediately to strike the jarring note. Well, you're, with your theory that somebody is lying, Mrs. Travers, I'm in complete agreement. But when you assert that it is my butler, I must join issue with you. Mr. Wooster has been exceedingly clever, most ingenious. Oh, thanks. But I'm afraid that I find myself unable to dismiss him, as you suggest, without a stain on his character. In fact, to be frank with you, I do not propose to dismiss him at all. He gave me the pince nez in a cold and menacing manner. I can't remember when I've seen a man I like the look of less. You may possibly recall, Mr. Wooster, that in the course of our conversation in my library, I informed you that I took the very gravest view of this affair. Your suggestion that I might be content with inflicting a fine of five pounds, as was the case when you appeared before me at Bosch, a person of Constable Oates would, when apprehended, serve a prison sentence. I see no reason to revise that decision. This statement had a mixed press. Eustace Oates obviously approved. He looked up from the helmet with a quick, encouraging smile, and but for the iron restraint of discipline would, I think, have said, Hear, hear. Aunt Dahlia and I, on the other hand, didn't like it. Here, come, I say now, Sir Watkin, really dash it, he expostulated, always on her toes when the interests of the clan were threatened. You can't do that sort of a thing. Madam, I can, I both can and will. He twiddled a hand in the direction of Eustace Oates. Constable. He didn't add, arrest this man or do your duty, but the officer got the gist. He clumped forward zealously. I was rather expecting him to lay a hand on my shoulder or to produce the jives and apply them to my wrists, but he didn't. He merely lined up beside me as if he were going to do a duet and stood there looking puff-faced. Aunt Dahlia continued to plead in reason. But you can't invite a man to your house and the moment he steps inside the door, calmly bung him into the coop. If this, is, if this is Gloucestershire hospitality, then heaven help Gloucestershire. Mr. Wooster is not here on my invitation, but on my daughter's. That makes no difference. You can't wriggle out of it like that. He is your guest. He has eaten your salt. And let me tell you, while we were on the subject, that there was a lot too much of it in the soup tonight. Oh, would you say that? I said. Just about right, it seems to me. No, too salty. Pop Bassett intervened. I must apologise for the shortcomings of my cook. I may be making a change before long. 
Meanwhile, to return to the subject with which we were dealing, Mr. Wooster is under arrest, and tomorrow I shall take the necessary steps to... And what's going to happen to him tonight? We maintain a small but serviceable police station in the village, presided over by Constable Oates. Oates! Oates will doubtlessly be able to find him accommodation. You aren't proposing to lug the poor chap off to a police station at this time of night. You could at least let him doss in a decent bed. Yes, I see no objection to that. One does not wish to be unduly harsh. You may remain in this room until tomorrow, Mr. Wooster. Oh, thanks. I shall lock the door. Oh, quite. And take charge of the key. Uh, oh, rather. And Constable Oates will patrol beneath the window for the remainder of the night. Sir, this will check Mr. Wooster's known propensity for dropping things from windows. You had better take up your station at once, Oates. Very good, sir. There was a note of quiet anguish, anguish in the officer's voice, and it was plain that the smug satisfaction with which he had been watching the progress of events had waned. His views on getting his eight hours were apparently the same as Aunt Dahlia's. Saluting sadly, he left the room in a depressed sort of way. He had his helmet again, but you could see that he was beginning to ask himself if helmets were everything. And now, Mr. Mrs. Travers, I should like, if I may, to have a word with you in private. They oiled off, and I was alone. I don't mind confessing that my emotions, as the key turned in the lock, were a bit poignant. On the, other, on the one hand, it was nice to feel that I had got my bedroom to myself for a few minutes, but against that you had to put the fact that I was in what is known as durance vile, and not likely to get out of it. Of course, this was not new stuff for me, for I had heard the bars clang outside my cell door that time at Bosher Street, but on that occasion I had been able to buoy myself up with the reflection, reflection that the worst the aftermath was likely to provide was a rebuke from the bench, or, as subsequently proved to be the case, a punch in the pocketbook. I was not faced, as I was faced now, by the prospect of waking on the morrow to begin serving a sentence of thirty days' duration in a prison, where it was most improbable that I should be able to get my morning cup of tea. Nor did the consciousness that I was innocent seem to help much. I drew no consolation from the fact that Stiffy Bing thought me like Sidney Carton, I had never met the chap, but I gathered that he was somebody who had taken it on the chin to oblige a girl. And to, Muma, to my mind, this was enough to stamp him as a priceless ass. Sidney Carton and Bertram, Sidney Carton and Bertram Wooster, I felt. Nothing to choose between them. Sidney, one of the mugs. Bertram, the same. I went to the window and looked out. Recalling the moody distaste which Constable Oates had exhibited at the suggestion that he should stand guard during the night hours, I had a faint hope that once the eye of authority was removed, he might have ducked the assignment and gone to get his beauty sleep. But no, there he was, padding up and down on the lawn, the picture of vigilance, and I had just gone to the wash, the wash hand stand to get a cake of soap to bung at him, feeling that this might soothe the bruised spirit a bit, when I heard the door handle rattle. I stepped across and put my lips to the woodwork. Hello, you desire, sir, Jeeves. No, oh, hello, Jeeves. The door appears to be locked. Sir, and you can take it from me, Jeeves, that appearances do not deceive. Pop Bassett locked it and has trousered the key. And sir, I have been pinched. Indeed, sir. What was that? No, I said, respectful tut tutting. Unfortunate, sir. Most. Well, Jeeves, what is your news? I endeavoured to locate Mr. Such events has taken us far past the point where Spode could have been of service. Anything else been happening at your end? No, I have had a word with Miss Bing, sir. I should like a word with her myself. What had she to say? The young lady was in considerable distress of mind. She appears to have taken umbrage at the part played by Mr. Pinker in allowing the purloiner of the cow cream to effect his escape. Why do you say his? From motives of prudence, sir. Walls have ears. Now I see what you mean. That's rather neat, Jeeves. Thank you, sir. I mused a while on this latest development. There were certainly aching hearts in Gloucestershire, all right, this PM. I was conscious, conscious of a pang of pity. Despite the fact that it was entirely owing to Stiffy that I found myself in my present predic, I wished the young loony well and mourned for her in her hour of disaster. So, he's bunged a spanner into Stiffy's romance as well as Gussie's, has he? 
That old bird has certainly been throwing his weight about tonight, Jeeves. Yes, sir. There's not a thing to be done about it, as far as I can see. Can you see anything to be done about it? No, sir. And switching to another aspect of the affair, you haven't any immediate plans for getting me out of this, I suppose? Not adequately formulated, sir. I'm turning over an idea in my mind. Turn well, Jeeves. Spare no effort. But it is at present merely nebulous. It involves finesse, I presume? Yes, sir. I shook my head. Waste of time, really, of course, because he couldn't see me. Still, I shook it. It's no good trying to be subtle and snaky now, Jeeves. What is required is rapid action. And a thought has occurred, occurred to me. We were speaking not long since of the time when Sir Roderick Glossop was immured in the potting shed with Constable Dobson guarding every exit. Do you remember what old Pop Stoker's idea was for coping with the situation? If I recollect rightly, sir, Mr. Stoker advocated a physical... And though we scouted the idea at the time, it seems to me now that he displayed a considerable amount of rugged good sense. These practical self-made men have a way of going straight to the point and avoiding such shovel somewhere and step down... I fear, sir. Come on, Jeeves. This is no time for nolla prosequi. I know you like finesse, but you just... You must see that it won't help us now. The moment has arrived when only shovels can serve. You could go and engage him in conversation, keeping the instrument concealed behind your back and waiting for the psychological... Excuse me, sir. I think I hear somebody coming. Well, ponder over what I've said. Who is coming? It is Sir Watkin and Mrs. Travers, sir. I fancy they are about to call upon you. When the door was unlocked a few moments later, however, only the relative entered. She made for the old familiar armchair and dumped herself heavily on in it. Her demeanour was sombre, encouraging no hope that she had come to announce that Pop Bassett, wiser counsel having prevailed, had decided to set me free. And yet I'm dashed if that wasn't precisely what she had come to announce. Well, Bertie, she said, having brooded in silence for a space, get on with your packing. Eh? He's called it off. Called it off? Yes, in blood. She was still carrying on with her sombre sitting, and I looked at her with a touch of reproach. You don't seem very pleased. No, oh, I'm delighted. I failed to detect the symptoms, I said, rather coldly. I should have thought that a nephew's reprieve at the foot of the scaffold, as you might, just might say, would have produced a bit of leaping and springing about. A deep sigh escaped her. Well, the trouble is, Bertie, there's a catch in it. The old buzzard has made a condition of freedom. He says he would agree not to press the charge if I let him have Anatole, the darned old blackmailer. A spasm of anguish twisted her features. It was not so very long since she had been speaking in high terms of blackmail and giving it her hearty approval. But if you want to derive real satisfaction from blackmail, you have to be at the right end of it. Catching it coming, as it were, instead of going, this woman was suffering. I wasn't feeling any too good myself. From time to time in the course of this narrative, I've had occasion to indicate my sentiments regarding Anatole, that peerless artist, and you will remember that the relative's account of how, how Sir Watkin Bassett had basically tried to snitch him from her employment during his visit to Brinkley Court had shocked me to my foundations. It is difficult, of course, to convey to those who have not tasted this wizard's product the extraordinary importance which his roasts and boils assume in the scheme of things, to those who have. I can only say that having once bitten into one of his dishes, you are left with the feeling that life will be deprived of all its poetry and meaning unless you are in a position to go on digging in. The thought that Aunt Dahlia was prepared to sacrifice this wonder man merely to save a nephew from the cooler was one that struck home and stirred. I don't know when I have been so profoundly moved. It was with a melting eye that I gazed at her. She reminded me of Sidney Carton. You are actually contemplating giving up Anatole for my sake, I gasped. Of course. Of course, jolly well not. I wouldn't hear of such a thing. But you can't go to prison. I certainly can, if my going means that that supreme maestro will continue working at the old stand. Don't dream of meeting old Bassett's demands. Bertie, do you mean this? I should say so. What's a mere thirty days in the second division? A bagatelle. I can do it on my head. Let Bassett do his worst. And... I said, added in a softer voice, when my time is up and I come out into the world once more a free man, let Anatole do his best. A month of bread and water or skilly or whatever they feed you on in these establishments will give me a rare appetite. On the night when I emerge, 
I shall expect a dinner that will live in legend and song. You shall have it. We might be sketching out the details now. No time like the present. Start with caviar or cantaloupe. Uh, and cantaloupe, followed by a strengthening soup. Thick or clear? More. Perhaps you're right. I think I am. I feel I am. I'd best leave the ordering to you. It might be wisest. I took pencil and paper, and some ten minutes later I was in a position to announce the result. This, then, I said, subject to such additions as I may think out in my cell, is the menu as I see it. And I read as follows. Le dinner. Caviar fraise. Cantaloupe. Consomme à pommes d'amour. Sylphides à la crème d'écrevaises. Mignonette de poulet de petit duc. Pommes d'asperges à la mistinguette. Supreme de foie gras champagne. Neige à pearls de apres. Timbalé de riz de vu tout le sein. It seems we've missed out much. Then let's have the man in and defy him. Bat it, I cried. Bat it, shouted Aunt Dahlia. Bat it, I bawled, making the welkin ring. It was still ringing when he popped in, looking annoyed. What the devil are you shouting at me like that for? Ah, there you are, Bassett. I wasted no time in getting down to the agenda. Bassett, we defy you. The man was plainly taken aback. He threw a questioning look at Aunt Dahlia. He seemed to be feeling that Bertram was speaking in riddles. He's alluding, explained the relative, to that idiotic offer of yours to call the thing off if I let you have Anatole. Silliest idea I ever heard. We've been having a good laugh about it, haven't we, Bertie? Roaring our heads off, I assented. He seemed stunned. Do you mean that you refuse? Of course, of course we refuse. I might have known my nephew better than to suppose for an instant that he would consider bringing sorrow and bereavement to an aunt's home in order to save himself unpleasantness. The Woosters are not like that, are they, Bertie? I should say not. They don't put self first. You bet they don't. I ought never to have insulted him by mentioning the offer to him. I apologise, Bertie. Quite all right, old flesh and blood. She wrung my hand. Good night, Bertie, and goodbye. Or rather, au revoir. We shall meet again. Absolutely. When the fields are white with daisies, if not sooner. By the way, didn't you forget Nonette de la Méditerranée, eh, Fenouille? Fenouille? Uh, so I did. And sell d'un mot à l'été à la grecque. Shove them on the charge sheet, will you? Her departure, which was accompanied by a melting glance of admiration and esteem over her shoulder as she navigated across the threshold, was followed by a brief and, on my part, haughty silence. After a while, Pop Bassett spoke in a strained and nasty voice. Well, Mr. Wooster, it seems that after all you will have to pay the penalty of your folly. Quite. I may say that I have changed my mind by allowing you to spend the night under my roof. You will go to the police station. Vindictive, Bassett. Not at all. I see no reason why Constable Oates should be deprived of his well-earned sleep merely to suit your convenience. I will send for him. He opened the door. Here, you. It was a most improper way of addressing Jeeves, but the faithful fellow did not appear to resent it. Sir, on the lawn outside the house... You will find Constable Oates. Bring him here. Very good, sir. I think Mr. Spode wishes to speak to you, sir. Eh? Mr. Spode, sir. He is coming along the passage now. Earl Bassett came back into the room, seeming displeased. I wish Roderick would not interrupt me at a time like this, he said querulously. I cannot imagine what reason he can have for wanting to see me. I laughed lightly. The irony of the thing amused me. He is coming a bit late, to tell you that he was with me when the cow creamer was pinched, thus clearing me of the guilt. I see. Yes, as you say, he is somewhat late. I shall have to explain to him. Ah, Roderick. The massive frame of R. Spode appeared in the doorway. Come in, Roderick, come in. But you need not have troubled, my dear fellow. Mr. Wooster has made it quite evident that he had nothing to do with the theft of my cow creamer. It was that that you wished to see me about, was it not? Well... Oh, uh, no, said Roderick Spode. There was an odd, strained look on the man's face. His eyes were glassy, and as far as a thing of that size was capable of being fingered, he was fingering his moustache. He seemed to be bracing himself for some unpleasant task. Well, uh, no, he said. The fact is, I, I hear there's been some trouble about that helmet's 
I stole from Constable Oates. There was a stunned silence. Old Bassett goggled. I goggled. Roderick Spode continued to finger his moustache. It was a silly thing to do, he said. I see that now. I uh, yielded to an uncontrollable impulse. One does sometimes, doesn't one? You remember, I told you I once stole a policeman's helmet at Oxford. I was hoping I could keep quiet about it, but Wooster's man tells me that you've got the idea that Wooster did it, so of course I had to come and tell you. Th that's all. I think I'll go to bed, said Roderick Spode. Good night. He edged off, and the stunned silence started functioning again. I suppose there may have been men who looked bigger asses than Sir Watkin Bassett at this moment, but I have never seen one in myself. The tip of his nose had gone bright scarlet, and his pince-nez were hanging limply at an angle of forty-five. Consistently through this, consistently though he had snooted me from the very inception of our relations, I felt almost sorry for the poor old blighter. Hmm, <clears throat> he said at length. He struggled with the vocal cords for a space. They seemed to have gone twisted on him. It appears that I owe you an apology, Mr. Wooster. They say no more about it, Bassett. I am sorry that all this has occurred. Don't mention it. My innocence is established. That is all that matters. I presume that I am now at liberty to depart. Oh, certainly, certainly. Good night, Mr. Wooster. Good night, Bassett. I need scarcely say, I think, that I hope this will be a lesson to you. I dismissed him with a distant nod and stood there wrapped in thought. I could make nothing of what had, what had occurred. Following, following the old and tried Oates method of searching for the motive, I had to confess myself baffled. I could only suppose that this was the Sidney Carton spirit bobbing up again. And then a sudden blinding light seemed to flash upon me. Jeeves, sir, were you behind this thing? Sir, don't keep saying sir, you know what I'm talking about. Was it you who egged Spode on to take the rap? I wouldn't say he smiled, he practically never does, but a muscle about the mouth did seem to quiver slightly for an instant. I did venture to suggest to Mr. Spode that it would be a graceful act on his part to assume the blame, sir. My line of argument was that he would be saving you a great deal of unpleasantness while running no risk himself. I pointed out to him that Sir Watkin, being engaged to marry his aunt, would hardly be likely to inflict inflict upon him the sentence which he had contemplated inflicting upon you. One does not send a gentleman to prison if one is betrothed to their aunt. Profoundly true, Jeeves, but I still don't get it. Do you confess he just right out, without a murmur? Not precisely without a murmur, sir. At first I must confess he betrayed a certain reluctance. I think I may have influenced his decision by informing him that I knew all about... I uttered a cry. You lady? Yes, sir. A passionate desire to get to the bottom of this you lady thing swept over me. Jeeves, tell me, what did Spode actually do to the girl? Murder her? I feel I am not at liberty to say, sir. Come on, Jeeves. No, I fear not, sir. I gave it up. Oh, well. I started shedding the garments. I climbed into the pyjamas. I slid into bed. The sheets being inextricably knotted, it would be necessary, I saw, to nestle between the blankets but I was prepared to rough it for one evening. A rapid surge of, event, of events had left me pensive. I sat with my arms round my knees, meditating on fortune's swift changes. An odd thing, life, Jeeves. Very odd, sir. You never know where you are with it, do you? To take a simple instance, I little thought half an hour ago that I would be sitting here in carefree pyjamas watching you, sir. So. But now my troubles, as you might say, have vanished like the dew on the... What is it? Thanks to you. I am delighted to have been able to be of service, sir. You have delivered the goods as seldom before, and yet, Jeeves, there was always a snag. <coughs> sir? I wish you wouldn't keep on, on saying, sir. What I mean is, Jeeves, loving hearts have been sundered in this vicinity, and are still sundered. I may be all right, I am, but Gussie isn't all right, nor is Stiffy all right. That is the fly in the ointment. Yes, sir. Though, pursuant on that, I never could see why flies shouldn't be in ointment. What harm do they do? I wonder, sir. Yes, Jeeves. I was merely about to inquire if it is your intention to bring an action against Sir Watkin for wrongful arrest and defamation of your character before witnesses. I hadn't thought of that. You think an action would lie? 
And there can be no question about it, sir. Both Mrs. Travers and I could offer overwhelming testimony. You are undoubtedly in a position to mulct Sir Watkin in heavy damages. Yes, I suppose you're right. No doubt that was why he went up in the air to such an extent when Spode did his act. Yes, sir. Uh, his trained legal mind would have envisaged the peril. I don't think I ever saw a man go so red in the nose, did you? No, sir. Still, it seems a shame to hurry him further. I don't know that I actually want to grind the old bird into dust. I was merely thinking, sir, that were you to threaten such an action, Sir Watkin, in order to avoid unpleasantness, might see his way to ratifying the betrothals of Miss Bassett and Miss Fincknottle and Miss Bing and the Reverend Mr. Pinker. Golly, Jeeves, put the bite on him, what? Precisely, sir. The thing shall be put in train immediately. I sprang from the bed and nipped to the door. Bat it, I yelled. There was no immediate response. The man had presumably gone to earth, but after I, after I had persevered for some minutes, shouting, Bat it, at regular intervals with increasing volume, I heard the distant sound of pattering feet, and along he came in a very different spirit from that which he had exhibited on the previous occasion. This time it was more like some eager waiter answering the bell. Yes, Mr. Wooster. I led the way back into the room and hopped into bed again. There is something you wish to say to me, Mr. Wooster. There are about a dozen things I wish to say to you, Bassett, but the one we will touch on at the moment is this. Are you aware that your headstrong conduct in sicking police officers on to pinch me and locking me in my room has laid you open to action for... What was it, Jeeves? Wrongful arrest and defamation of character before witnesses, sir. That's the baby. I could soak you for millions. What are you going to do about it? He writhed like an electric fan. I'll tell you what you are going to do about it. I proceeded. You are going to issue your OK on the union of your daughter Madeline and Augustus Finknottle, and also on that of your niece Stephanie and the Rev. H.P. Pinker, and you will do it now. A short struggle seemed to take place in him. It might have lasted longer if he hadn't caught my eye. Very well, Mr. Wooster. And touching that cow creamer, it is highly probable that the international gang that got away with it will sell it to my Uncle Tom. Their system of underground information will have told them that he is in the market. Not a yip out of you, Bassett, if at some future date you see that cow creamer in his collection. Very well, Mr. Wooster. And one other thing. You owe me a fiver. I beg your pardon? In repayment of the one you took off me at Bosher Street. I shall want that before I leave. I will write you a check in the morning. I shall expect it on the breakfast tray. Good night, Bassett. Good night, Mr. Wooster. Is that brandy I see over there? I should like a glass, if I may. Jeeves, a snootful for Sir Watkin Bassett. Very good, sir. He drained the preaker gracefully and tottered out. Probably quite a nice chap, if you know him. Jeeves broke the silence. I've finished the packing, sir. Good, then I think I'll curl up. Open the window, will you? Very good, sir. What sort of a night is it? Unsettled, sir. It has begun to rain with some violence. The sound of a sneeze came to my ears. Hello, who's that, Jeeves? Somebody out there? Constable Oates, sir. You don't mean he hasn't gone off duty? No, sir. I imagine that in his preoccupation with other matters, it escaped Sir Watkins' mind to send him word that there was no longer any necessity to keep his vigil. I sighed contentedly. It needed but this to complete my day. The thought of Constable Oates prowling in the rain like the troops of Midian when he could have been snug in bed, toasting his pink toes on the hot water bottle, gave me a curiously mellowing sense of happiness. This is the end of a perfect day, Jeeves. What's that thing of yours about larks? Sir? And, I rather think, snails. Oh, yes, sir. The years at the spring, the days at the morn, mornings at seven, the hillsides do pearl. But the larks, Jeeves, the snails, I'm pretty sure larks and snails enter to it, into it. I am coming to the larks uh, and snails, sir. The larks on the wing, the snails on the thorn. Now you're talking. And the tab line? God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. That's it in a nutshell. I couldn't have put it better myself. And yet, Jeeves, there is just one thing. I do wish you would give me the inside fact about you lately. I fear, sir. I would keep it dark. You know me, the silent tomb. The rules of the junior Ganymede 
are extremely strict, sir. I know, I know, but you might stretch a point. I am sorry, sir. I made the great decision. Jeeves, I said, give me the lowdown and I'll come on that world cruise of yours. He wavered. In this, well, in the strictest confidence, sir. Of course, Mr. Spode designs ladies' underclothing, sir. He has a considerable talent in that direction and has indulged it secretly for some years. He is the founder and proprietor of the Emporium in Bond Street, known as Eulalie Swirls. You don't mean that. Yes, sir. Good Lord, Jeeves. No wonder he didn't want a thing like that to come out. No, sir. It would unquestionably jeopardise his authority over his followers. You can't be a successful dictator and design women's underclothing. No, sir. One or the other, not both. Precisely, sir. I mused. Well, it was worth it, Jeeves. I couldn't have slept wondering about it. Perhaps that cruise won't be so very foul after all. Most gentlemen find them enjoyable, sir. Do they? Yes, sir. Seeing new faces. That's true. I hadn't thought of that. The faces will be new, won't they? Thousands and thousands of people, but no stiffy. Exactly, sir. 